ask our Chancellor, Father Christopher Fadock, to come forward for a prayer. As chancellor of our school, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you, especially, of course, to welcome Dr. Levering. Also, if I may, uh, as prior provincial, welcome you to the province of the most holy name of Jesus on behalf of the brothers. Thank God, thank you, that you can be with us tonight. Grateful to have you, to have all of you join us to praise, bless, preach the truth, our Lord Jesus. Jesus, who in his humanity is the way, and his divinity is the truth and the life. But Doctor, I don't have to tell you that, I'm sure. That'll probably crop up somewhere in the nine-volume dogmatics you're working on these days. But it's a joy to have you with us, and thank you. And it's a privilege for us to pray with you, pray with you. We'll pray for each other. We trust you will pray for us as we share the words of our brother, St. Thomas Aquinas. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Creator of all things, true source of light and wisdom, origin of all being. Graciously, let a ray of your light penetrate the darkness of our understanding. Take from us the double darkness in which we have been born, an obscurity of sin and ignorance. Give us a keen understanding, a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant us the talent of being exact in our explanations and the ability to express ourselves with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in the completion. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Thank you, Father Christopher, and thank you, uh, Father Pryor, uh, James Thompson, Father James Thompson and the Friars of St. Albert's for allowing us to have this event here as our campus up uh, at Arch and Vine is in a state of embarrassment currently from some, some, some flooding uh, damage that needs, needs repair, so we appreciate your, your prayers and support. Just some practicalities about the evening's uh, uh, festivities. Of course, uh, we're here to hear uh, Dr. Levering first, whose talk will go for about an hour, I, I have been told. And then we have some time for some questions and answers. Uh, so be thinking of what those might be if you uh, would care to, to ask some. And then, um, and then after that, we have some, some refreshments that uh, will be, be this way. So, uh, and I'll describe how the Q&A will work um, afterwards. And so, uh, without uh, further elaboration, I invite forward um, Father Dennis Klein, uh, uh, professor of theology at our school, DSBT. Tonight, we welcome Professor Matthew Levering to sunny California. It was my hope that we could convince him that visiting our campus frequently was a great way to take a break from the long winter of Chicago, where he currently lives, but the weather did not cooperate, as you can see. Professor Levering is the James and Matthew Perry Chair of Theology at Mundelein Seminary and the co-editor of the English edition of Nova and Vetera and the International Journal of Systematic Theology. He is one of the most sought after Thomistic theologians of our day and certainly one of the most productive. He has authored more than 35 books, 100 articles, and those are just his principal works. He has also edited, co-edited, translated dozens more books 
and produced literally hundreds of reviews, editorials, forewords, and other short pieces. His works have been translated into many different languages, including French, Czech, Romanian, and even Polish. And if this was not enough, he still finds time to be an advisor to numerous theological projects and organizations around the world, to lecture and organize conferences across the United States, and maintaining a, still maintaining a commanding presence on campus at Mundelein, where he teaches STL-level courses and directs and guides theses, and even the occasional dissertation. His most recent interests are reflected in the title of his latest work, Reconfiguring to Mystic Christology, the introduction of which we will be discussing at tomorrow's seminar at DSPT, and in the talk which he is giving tonight, which is entitled The Cross at the Center of Mystical the-, the Mystical Body, a Thomistic Approach. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Levering here to the D- Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology and to St. Albert's Prior. Is this on? Okay, so uh, can, can, you can hear me now. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, I'm, I'm always scared of microphones because um, I'm, not, I'm not a very good public speaker, but I, I, enjoy, um, I enjoy it. I just, microphones are things that scare me. So I once gave a, I once gave a lecture at, in Denver at a theological institute in Denver, and it turned out only the people in the front row could hear anything I was saying. But everybody else was smiling in the back, so it was, it was, it was okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm extremely honored to be here tonight for um, you know, such an uh, August occasion. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, many dear friends uh, are on the faculty here. Um, I really feel tremendously honored, in fact, way too honored. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to you guys, uh, Father Brian, and all the people who arranged this. Uh, Okay, so let me, um, my, my talk shouldn't, shouldn't take an hour. It, it, should, it should be uh, less than that, let's hope. Um, okay, it should be probably around 40, 45 minutes. So the cross of the center of the mystical body. Introduction. After Vatican II, much was made of the differences between a mystical body ecclesiology and a people of God ecclesiology. But what exactly is the mystical body of Christ? And why is this this image of the church important? I will answer this question, or explore the question, first by surveying some representative theological and magisterial writings from the mid-20th century, and second by turning to St. Thomas Aquinas. In an essay published in 2004, Herwey Rickov, a Dutch Thomist, argued persuasively for, quote, the relevance of Thomas Thomas's thought for present discussion of the church. As Rickoff observes, the one image of the church that Aquinas systematically develops is the image of the body of Christ. Rickoff notes that when Aquinas attends to the mystical body, Aquinas focuses on unity and plurality, the role of the Holy Spirit, the soul of the body, and Christ the head. Rickoff does not mention the cross of Christ, and this will be my focus. He argues that for Aquinas, the church is first of all a Trinitarian reality, the indwelling of the Trinity, and secondly, quote, the church is basically the community of believers, end quote. In a 1987 book, Thomas Aquinas' vision of the church, George Sabra draws attention to a wide range of literature treating Aquinas' understanding of the mystical body, including various studies published in the 30s and 40s. Sabra highlights the Eucharistic dimension of Aquinas' understanding of the mystical body, as well as Aquinas' emphasis on Christ's grace of headship as the source and the spirit of the, of the members' diverse gifts and offices. Sabra recognizes, quote, the church as corpus Christi mysticum is a central and characteristic designation in the ecclesiological thought of Thomas Aquinas, end quote. Yet Sabra, too, does not discuss the significance of the cross in Aquinas' doctrine of the mystical body. I will propose in this essay that for Aquinas, our communion with the risen Christ and one another in his mystical body takes shape through configuration to Christ's suffering and dying. 
Aquinas would concur, I, I believe, with the Anglican theologian Ephraim Radner's comment, quote, rightly Paul speaks of the church as the body of Christ, but it is a body taken up and ever dependent on the creative and recreative grace of God in Christ, which partakes always of judgment and mercy both in the cross, end quote. Thus, Aquinas' understanding of the mystical body befits the church of the martyrs and of those who have heeded Jesus' command to go into the world, quote, as sheep in the midst of wolves. In his understanding of the mystical body, Aquinas appreciates the central role of the grace of the Holy Spirit that unites the members of the body to the head and that provides for a diversity of gifts and vocations. But the outpouring of this grace and its ecclesial effects are inseparable from the cross. For Aquinas, as for Bonaventure and Sean Kohlberg's words, the Christian, quote, journey so, confirm, com, so conforms the soul to Christ that the wayfarer can eventually say, with Christ, I am nailed to the cross, end quote. Okay, now I'm going to do a short section on the mystical body in the 1960s, and I'm going to introduce three thinkers here, or three perspectives, Hans Kuhn, Jerome ha Hamer, I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, and Lumen, Lumen Gentium. In 1967, the theologian Hans Kuhn, who shortly thereafter distanced himself from a number of core Catholic beliefs, gave an important place to the cross in his reflections on the church as the mystical body of Christ. Kuhn remarks, quote, the application of the concept body to the ecclesia of Christ must have come all the more easily to Paul since the blood of Jesus, that is his sacrificial death, had already before Paul been invested with a continuing saving effect for the community of the present. For Paul, the risen body is also the crucified body, insofar as the latter has a continuing efficaciousness." End quote. The members of the church for Paul are members of Christ crucified. Kuhn draws together the cross, the Eucharist, and the church. The body of Christ on the cross for the redemption of the world is the same body that in the Eucharist becomes fruitful by applying the saving power of the cross for the salvation of the whole world. It is this crucified body of Christ that is coterminous with the church. Thus, Kuhn makes a strong connection between the cross and the mystical body. As Kuhn puts it, quote, the body on the cross is made present and efficacious in the present within the community itself, end quote. In a 1962 book, the Dominican theologian Jerome Hamer, an influential voice in the promotion of Catholic communion ecclesiology, devoted a chapter to the examining the mystical body from the perspective of Thomas Aquinas. Hamer notes that in the 1940s, some scholars criticized Aquinas' theology of the mystical body on the grounds that, quote, St. Thomas may have shown the influx of the life of Christ into the church but he did not give sufficient place to the corporeity of the mystical body, end quote. In response, Hamer directs attention to the instrumentality of Christ's humanity, and more specifically, to the human actions of Christ as causing grace in us. Hamer lays particular emphasis upon the Eucharist. The conclusion that Hamer draws is that for Aquinas, Christ's real body, quote, is the proper cause of the mystical body, as a conjoint instrument of the Son. Although Hamer's book focuses upon communion as the basis for ecclesiology, he draws his definition of the church from the theology of the mystical body. He defines the church as follows, quote, the church is the mystical body of Christ, that is to say a communion which is at once inward and external, the life of union with Christ, and established caused by the economy of Christ's mediation, end quote. Hamer examines the way in which the communion with Christ is interior and spiritual and also involves outward forms, including the episcopacy and papacy, as well as the generative causes of communion, the saving mysteries of Christ's life. Hamer thinks of the mystical body primarily in terms of interpersonal communion. Reflecting upon the New Testament meaning of koinonia, or communion, he recognizes that believers, quote, participate in the blood of Christ, his body, in his body, in the Son himself, in his sufferings, and in the Spirit. 
Let me now briefly examine Lumen Gentium's, very briefly, uh, Lumen Gentium's depiction of the mystical body. After completing his redemptive work, says Lumen Gentium, Christ poured out his spirit and thereby constituted his mystical body. All who receive the sacrament, specifically baptism and the Eucharist, are united to Christ and comprise his body. Through the Eucharist, believers, quote, are taken up into communion with him and with one another. The Holy Spirit functions analogously to how the soul functions in a human body insofar as the Spirit unifies the diverse members into one body by bestowing charity. And Christ reigns as the head of his body. The members of the body must be configured to him by suffering with him. While the cross is not the heart of this portrait of the mystical body, it certainly contains some references to the cross. Okay, a, a short section now before I turn to Aquinas on Pope Pius XII's encyclical Mystici Corporis from 1943. Before turning to Aquinas' theology, let me examine some aspects of Mystici Corporis pertaining to my theme. The completion of the mystical body, Mystici Corporis makes clear, took place on the cross. As the church fathers teach, the blood and water from the side of Christ established the church, which as the new Eve came forth from the side of the new Adam. Through the blood of Christ, the human race was reconciled to God, the gifts of the new covenant were poured out, and the church fully brought to be. On the cross, Christ is fully the head of the church, conquering original sin and uniting human beings to himself. On the cross, Christ gave to his body the divine gifts that ensure that the church can always teach, govern, and sanctify its members. As biblical evidence for the centrality of the cross in constituting the church, Mystici Corporis appeals to Ephesians 2, 13 to 16, where Paul says that the Gentile believers, quote, have been brought near in the blood of Christ, end quote, because Christ has united Jews and Gentiles by reconciling, quote, us both to God in one body through the cross. It is on this basis that the encyclical gives a place to the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost. Christ reigns, quote, directly and personally, end quote, as well as through the church's apostolic hierarchy. Christ gives particular graces to each member of his body. In this way, Christ configures the body to himself so that it's truly, quote, his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, Ephesians 1, 23. As head of the body, Masici Corporis emphasizes, Christ is not merely the leader of a community of people. Rather, quote, Christ is the divine savior of this body, end quote. This helps to explain why the cross must be central to the proper understanding of the mystical body. Christ, in and through his saving cross, continually acts for the sa salvation of his body. The mystical body is comprised of the Savior and those whom he saves. He not only reconciles the members of his body to God, but he also gives them supernatural and deifying life. He does the latter through the outpouring of the Spirit, who is, quote, the principle of every supernatural act in all parts of the body, end quote. Furthermore, the Eucharistic sacrifice unites the body of Christ in the saving self-offering of the head. In the Eucharistic sacrifice, the priest acts in persona Christi on behalf of the whole mystical body. In union with the priest's prayers, the faithful and thus the entire mystical body offer, offers the, the saving sacrifice of Christ to the Father. In the Eucharistic sacrifice, which is the church's offering of the one sacrifice of the cross, Christ can be said to offer Quote, to the Heavenly Father, not only himself as head of the church, but in himself, his mystical members also, since he holds them all, even those who are weak and ailing, in his most loving heart. End quote. The final paragraphs of Mystici Corporis highlight the love of Christ. Christ loves the whole human race, each and every human being. The encyclical reminds us that Christ's cross was for the salvation of the whole world with the goal of uniting the whole world into the body of Christ. We must therefore love all human beings as at least potential members of the body and as our brothers in Christ according to the flesh." End quote. Christ freely endured the cross out of love for his body, and so, quote, it was only at the price of his blood that he purchased the church. The members of the body are members only insofar as they, quote, follow gladly in the blood-stained footsteps of Christ the head. By sharing in his cross, members of the body will share, and even now share, in his resurrection. 
As the biblical scholar Michael Gorman says in his book, Cruciformity, Paul's Narrative Spirituality of the Cross, quote, as the community of the risen Lord, the church experiences the Lord's power, but as the community of the risen crucified Lord, that power is experienced only as power in weakness, as the power of love, end quote. Okay, so now I finally reach um, St. Thomas Aquinas um, on this topic, um, on the topic of the mystical body. Now, just some, ba some background. Um, I'm going to be focusing um, first on, on some of his biblical commentaries, and then I'm going to turn to the Tertiapars of the Summa. And my goal will be to, to display the cross at the center of the mystical body. Although Aquinas, of course, includes other themes as well, and I'm going to discuss those um, to some degree. Now, I should, I should um, pause here just to say the, the whole reason why I came up with this um, topic for my paper was that I had never thought of the mystical body, not even one time, in relation to the cross before, before all of a sudden it dawned on me that, that surely it must have something to do with the cross of our Lord if it is his body. And so I, I'm, I'm now looking out here at the audience and realizing that you guys have probably always thought of the mystical body in relation to the cross. But I, I have to admit to you that it was a new idea for me, and so that was why, that's why I'm doing all this. Um, so I, I do apologize if, you've had, if all this is seeming very obvious. Um, okay, so let me begin now talking about um, St. Thomas. Commenting on Ephesians 2.16, where Paul praises Christ for reconciling Jews and Gentiles, quote, in one body through the cross, Aquinas observes that the one body <clears throat> is the church, the body of Christ. Aquinas cites Romans 12.5 as supporting evidence, quote, we the many are one body in Christ, and predictably, in commenting on Romans 12.5, Aquinas likewise cites Ephesians 2.16 as supporting evidence there. It follows that the church is the mystical body of Christ due to Christ's cross. It is in and through the cross that human beings have been reconciled to God and united as one in Christ. Aquinas also credits the Holy Spirit poured out by Christ. He states, quote, this mystical body has a spiritual unity through which we are united to one another and to God by faith and love. In this regard, he cites Ephesians 4, 4, quote, there is one body and one spirit. He is correct to think of this passage from Ephesians as carrying forward Paul's earlier discussion of, quote, the blood of Christ by which Christ reconciled Jews and Gentiles to God in one body through the cross. If the fundamental principles of the mystical body are the cross and the grace of the Holy Spirit, another aspect of the mystical body is the diversity of the members' gifts and functions. When Aquinas comments on 1 Corinthians 12, he focuses upon this diversity in the body of Christ. As context for 1 Corinthians 12, recall 1 Corinthians 1 to 2, where Paul discusses the power of the cross. Commenting on 1 Corinthians 1 18, which is, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Aquinas explains what it means to be in Christ. Specifically, Christ's people or the members of his body have discovered, quote, in the cross of Christ, God's power by which he overcame the devil and the world. And then Aquinas quotes Revelation 5, 5, the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. When Aquinas turns to 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for, and which is, I'll quote it here, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ, end quote. Aquinas first reflects upon what it means to be one. He notes that a body is one because it has many members or organs. The body is made perfect by the presence of its diverse members, and therefore a body has perfect unity when it has all of its diverse members or organs. Analogously, Christ's body has perfect uni unity through its many members. These members perform all the diverse functions needed for the church's witness to Christ. In the sacrament of baptism, the Holy Spirit unites diverse human beings to Christ and establishes the unity of the church, which is the body of Christ. Some members follow the active life, some the contemplative, some are farmers, some are teachers, he says. 
He discusses offices in the church, including the apostolic office, the office of prophecy, and the office of teachers, as well as those who perform miracles or speak in foreign tongues. In the tertiary parts of the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas treats Christ as the head of the mystical body. He inquires into the grace of the Holy Spirit that Christ must have had and must have in order to give grace to all his members. Christ's holy humanity is united to the Word, and the Word breathes forth the Holy Spirit upon the, his humanity. The perfecting of the humanity of Christ is achieved not by the hypostatic union, but by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Aquinas observes that, quote, the habitual grace of Christ is understood to follow this union as light follows the sun, end quote. Since the habitual grace of Christ perfects him as an individual, the question is how Christ then can be the source of grace for all his members. Citing, one John, citing John 1, 14 to 16 and Romans 8, 29, Aquinas emphasizes that Christ is the source of our grace. If he were not the source of our grace, then he could not be, obviously, head of the whole human race. As head of the mystical body, Christ aims to perfect the body. And the source of this perfecting is the cross. Aquinas explains, quote, to be a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, is the ultimate end to which we are brought by the passion of Christ, end quote. By the power of his cross, Christ conquered sin and enables us to be configured to his holy image. The reference here is Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, where Paul states that, quote, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, and that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish, end quote. According to Paul in Ephesians 5, just as husband and wife become one body or one flesh, Genesis 2.24, so Christ and the church are one body. Quote, for no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church because we are members of his body, end quote. Aquinas states in commenting on Ephesians 5, 25, um, quote, the sign of Christ's love for the church is that he delivered himself up for it on the cross. And he adds that, Christ's sanctifying of the church is, quote, the effect of Christ's death, end quote, not least because baptism has its, quote, power from the passion of Christ, end quote. Aquinas contends that Christ's habitual grace and his grace of headship are the same. Christ does not possess a different grace as head of the church than he does as man. Aquinas reasons, quote, he is our head in as much as we receive from him, Therefore, he is our head inasmuch as he has the fullness of grace. Now, he had the fullness of grace inasmuch as personal grace was in him in its perfection, end quote. Christ has the fullness of the grace of the Holy Spirit, and it's from this fullness that he's able to bestow grace upon all his members. Aquinas comments that in, in an exterior manner, people, people can be the cause of the communication of grace to others through their leadership roles in the church for example, as heads of dioceses or of the whole church, uh, for example, the Pope. But no one can communicate interior grace other than Christ. In his discussion of the effects of Christ's passion, Aquinas makes explicit reference to the mystical body. Christ's passion accomplishes its effects not for Christ, since Christ, of course, needs no healing from sin, but for us. Aquinas describes the effect of deliverance from sin, quote, Christ's passion causes forgiveness of sin by way of redemption. For since he is our head, then by the passion which he endured from love and obedience, he delivered us as his members from our sins, end quote. Aquinas compares this to the way in which in a human body the hands may work to redeem an offense committed by the feet. He further and I, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not quite sure what that means. The hands, I, I have to say, I often, I often don't really understand Aquinas' examples all that well, but there, there's, some, there's some sense to it. I'll, I'll, think, I'll think about this while I'm, while I'm reading the rest of the paper. Okay, um, he further explains the reference to the mystical body. Quote, for just as a natural, the natural body is one though made up of diverse members, so the whole church, Christ's mystic body, is reckoned as one person with its head, which is Christ. End quote. Therefore, what the members have done, namely sinned, 
is redeemed by what the head does on the cross. The action of the head justifies the members because the members have been united to the head as his body through the grace of the Holy Spirit, joining humans to Christ. As Aquinas said somewhat further on, although Christ's passion in itself is superabundantly sufficient for the salvation of all human beings, quote, Christ's passion works its effect in them to whom it is applied through faith and charity and the sacraments of faith, end quote. Not only must sinners be joined to Christ's body and thereby share in the redemptive power of his cross, but also sinners must be configured to Christ as members to the head. And this begins through baptism. Aquinas treats these matters sometimes without mentioning the mystical body, but he mentions it quite often. For instance, in his reply to an objection, he remarks, quote, Christ's satisfaction works its effect in us inasmuch as we are incorporated with him as the members with their head. Now, the members must be conformed to their head. This conforming or configuration to Christ the head is complex. Christ had a passable body and a graced soul, and through his passion, he attained to immortality and glory. We as his members then receive the effect of his passion, but we are not yet made immortal. This is because we must be configured to his cross, his passion in our passable bodies. Aquinas states that we, quote, who are his members, are freed by his, his cross or his passion from all debt of punishment, end quote, which might seem to entail that no, we no longer will suffer or die. But in fact, of course, we still do suffer and die. This is because it is, it is through being configured, quote, to the sufferings of death of Christ that we are brought into a mortal glory, end quote. The members must follow the path taken by the head. In support of his position, Aquinas cites Romans 8, 17, where Paul promises that we will be, quote, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him, end quote. In addition to the cross, the, the resurrection and the ascension are also central to the mystical body, as is the grace of the Holy Spirit. Meditating upon Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father, Aquinas directs attention to Romans 8, 11, where Paul states, quote, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit who dwells in you, end quote. Aquinas here finds a connection between the mystical body, our union with Christ through the spirit, and the resurrection. He avers, quote, since Christ is our head, then what was bestowed on Christ is bestowed on us through him, end quote. Now, Paul maintains in Ephesians 2, 6, that God has, quote, raised us up with him, with Christ, and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, end quote. Discussing the ascension, Aquinas comments that if our head is, quote, already raised up, then in a sense, we are already raised up with him as his body. We have a foretaste of his risen life insofar as we are even now in Christ. In faith, we know that we will be raised and will ascend with Christ so as to sit with him at the right hand of the Father, that is, in the heavenly places. This will happen, says Aquinas, quote, for the very reason that our Christ, our head, sits there. Thus, both Christ's resurrection and his ascension bear upon the present and future status of the mystical body, not only head, but also members. For Aquinas, sitting at the right hand of the Father means being taken up into the Father's power and glory. Here we should recall Christ's promise to the church in Laodicea, quote, he who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I myself conquered and sat down with my Father on his throne, Revelation 3.21. The members of Christ's body will share in what the head fully, uh, what the head alone fully possesses. The repeated references to the Father and the Holy Spirit show that the mystical body of the incarnate Son is a Trinitarian reality. Yet I propose that we consider Christ's cross at the center. As the theologian Rock Koreski rightly remarks, summarizing Augustine's ecclesiology, quote, 
through the cross, Christ has purified the church and joined her to himself so as to become unicaro, one flesh with him. The union of Christ integrates us into his body person and joins us to his ascent to heaven. End quote. Koretsky's book, The Church of God and Jesus Christ, devotes some pages to Aquinas' ecclesiology, and he recognizes how important the image of the mystical body is for Aquinas. Father Koretsky comments, quote, St. Thomas explains in detail the juridical and institutional aspect of the church, hierarchy, teaching office, sacraments, church laws, but he never loses sight, says Koretsky, of the primary aspect that the church is primarily a community of believers united to Christ through faith and love and conformed to him. And I would add that this communion and conformity have on earth the cross at the center. It is by the power of the cross that Christ redeems his members who in turn must be configured to the cross in their fellowship as members of the body. Aquinas also treats the mystical body in his account of Christ as judge. At the final judgment, Christ will judge all mankind and he will set to rights the entirety of human history and fully reveal the wisdom and goodness of the divine plan. While the entire Trinity will judge the world, wisdom is appropriated, says Aquinas, especially to the word. And so judiciary power is attributed to Christ in particular. Drawing upon Augustine, Aquinas remarks that, quote, judiciary authority is attributed to the Father inasmuch as he is the principle of the Son, but the very rule of judgment is attributed to the Son who is the art and wisdom of the Father." End quote. As man, Christ will judge the world, communicating the Trinity's judgment. Aquinas cites John 5, 27, quote, "'For as the Father has life in himself, "'so has he granted the Son also to have life in himself "'and has given him authority to execute judgment "'because he is the Son of Man.'" End quote. Other biblical texts such as 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Romans 14, 9 to 10, and Acts, and Acts 10, 42 play a role in Aquinas' discussion here as do the reflections of Augustine and John Chrysostom. Indeed, Aquinas contests Chrysostom's suggestion that Christ is judged only as the divine son and not as man. In response, Aquinas appeals to Christ's headship of the mystical body. He states, quote, Christ, even in, in his human nature, is head of the entire church. Consequently, it belongs to him, even according to his human nature, to ex exercise judiciary power. Now, Christ judges in accordance with his priestly sacrifice on the cross and with his intercession. Citing Hebrews 4.15, Aquinas highlights the point that Christ the judge is not aloof from other humans, but rather has shown intimate solidarity with them in his suffering. As the true high priest, Christ, quote, appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, Hebrews 9, 26. Aquinas affirms that Christ's judgment is both Trinitarian and Christological. Well, of course it's Christological. I, I don't know why, um, that's embarrassing. Um, insofar as, quote, judiciary power belongs to the man Christ on account of both his divine personality and the dignity of his headship and the fullness of his habitual grace. Again, the cross is here at the center of the mystical body of Christ the head. Let me add a brief word regarding the Eucharistic dimension of the mystical body. For Aquinas at the heart of the sacramental order is Christ's passion, his cross. It follows that the cross is the, quote, final cause that is the goal of the sacraments of the Mosaic law. With respect to the sacraments of the new law of grace, Aquinas portrays these sacraments in terms of the distinction between a united instrument, Christ's humanity, and a separated instrument, the sacraments, moved by the united instrument. To understand the sacraments of the new law, says Aquinas, we must recognize that, quote, Christ delivered us from our sins principally through his passion, his cross. Sacraments unite us to the cross's reconciling and deifying power. Aquinas comments that, quote, the sacraments of the church derive their power especially from Christ's passion, the virtue of which is in a manner united to us by our receiving the sacraments, end quote. Now, among the sacraments, the Eucharist has preeminence as the one to which all the others are directed. 
Taken together, the seven sacraments are, of course, an integrated organism. Aquinas compares their role in the spiritual life to our bodily needs. Baptism corresponds to generation and birth, confirmation to growing to maturity, the Eucharist to our daily nourishment, and so on. In baptism, Aquinas says, the grace of the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the virtues are infused into the baptized person's soul, inaugurating the fullness of supernatural life and making the person a member of Christ's body. Aquinas here again cites John 1.16, combined with a text from Augustine, crediting baptism with incorporating a person into Christ's body. Reiterating that, quote, the fullness of grace and virtues flows from Christ the head to all his members, end quote, Aquinas explores what this means for baptism. He underscores baptism's constitutive relation to the mystical body. As he states, quote, by baptism, man is born again unto the spiritual life. Now life is only in those members that are united to the head from which they derive sense and movement. And therefore, it follows of necessity that by baptism, man is incorporated in Christ as one of his members, end quote. Aquinas describes his sense and movement as knowledge of the true faith, that's the sense, and the instinct of grace, the movement, making it possible to perform virtuous acts. To be a member of Christ's body is to have this supernatural life. People who are baptized as adults will already be members of Christ's body through faith, but such faith inc includes the desire to be baptized. Baptism incorporates us into Christ's body, and the Eucharist completes our fellowship or communion with Christ since we receive Christ himself and our change, as it were, into Christ. Through baptism, we are, quote, born anew in Christ in virtue of his passion. And through the Eucharist, we are made perfect, quote, in union with Christ who suffered, end quote. In these sacraments, the cross is at the center of our incorporation into and union with Christ as members of his mystical body. Let me conclude this discussion of Aquinas on Christ's mystical body by directing attention to two passages that appear in Aquinas' discussion of the efficient causality of Christ's passion. Question 48 of the Tertia Pars. Aquinas reiterates that, quote, grace was bestowed upon Christ not only as an individual, but inasmuch as he is head of the church, so that it might overflow into his members. End quote. To this point, to this uh, um, statement, he adds a surprising claim. The unity of the mystical body is so profound, says Aquinas, that, quote, Christ's works are referred to himself and to his members in the same way as the works of any other man in a state of grace are referred to himself, end quote. So this means that when Christ dies on the cross, his action belongs in its merit, not only to Christ, but also to his members. He acts on our behalf in the fullest possible sense to such a degree that we can be said to merit, and as his members, we can be said to merit in his action on the cross. Aquinas lays down a radical principle, one that is grounded in Augustine, quote, the head and members are as one mystic person and therefore Christ's satisfaction belongs, his satisfaction on the cross, belongs to all the faithful as being his members, end quote. So the cross is at the center of the mystical body because believers are, quote, one mystical person with Christ on the cross. Okay, now a very short conclusion. I, I chopped out five pages out of this before, before coming, so maybe I should have left those... Um, they might have had the good parts. I, I don't know what part I did chop out. Okay, so in conclusion. In his book, The Whole Christ, The Historical Development of the Doctrine of the Mystical Body in Scripture and Tradition, the theologian Emile Mersch argues that in the 13th century, the, in 13th century theologians, quote, the doctrine of the mystical body no longer occupies its position of prominence, end quote. But... But Mersch recognizes that even in the 13th century, the mystical body was hardly ignored. According to Mersch, in the 13th century, quote, the treaties on the mystical body received, in fact, its structure and its essential content. He especially values Aquinas' insistence that Christ as head communicates his own personal grace. 
to the members of his body. As Marsh observes, Aquinas thereby presents, quote, the whole life of grace in the members of the mystical body as a prolongation of that supreme grace whereby the head of the body is constituted the very Son of God and the Holy of Holies, end quote. Although, of course, Aquinas firmly differentiates between Christ's grace of union and his habitual grace. Mersch also acknowledges that for Aquinas, all Christ's actions, quote, especially his passion and death, his resurrection and ascension, affect us directly, end quote. Aquinas' argument that Christ and his members act as, quote, one mystic person deeply impressed Mersch. Since this is so, when Christ suffers, quote, when Christ suffers, all humanity is redeeming itself in him, uh, says Mersch. It seems to me that attention to Christ's cross at the center of the mystical body enables one to perceive the amplitude and richness of this body. We tend to think of the mystical body as, at least this is me, now I'm speaking in my, um, as my, for my own way of thinking. We tend to think of the mystical body as solely a glorious fellowship of grace, a communion of persons sharing in all pleasant things. When one apprehends how central Christ's cross is to Aquinas' account of the mystical body, one perceives that the communion of the mystical body is not simply a graced fellowship in, in, in so-called pleasant things. On earth, it is a cruciform fellowship, grounded firmly in Christ's cross, calling us to what Michael Gorman, the biblical scholar, calls cruciformity. As Gorman says, quote, cruciformity summons people to adopt a posture before God of radical self-offering, to become a sort of Christ for others, to accept weakness as strength, and to yearn confidently for their own bodily resurrection and for the transformation of the entire creation, end quote. It is this profoundly transformative cruciform stance that in Aquinas' vision characterizes the church precisely as the mystical body. Thank you very much.